sometimes our work got into um, action props as well as miniatures. And, and Brainstorm and Masters of the Universe were probably my two biggest action prop shows. But Brainstorm was, we did some really remarkable stuff on Brainstorm. So we applied all these techniques of, of you know, fine detailed miniatures to some of these action props like had not been done before and really got some incredibly detailed looks in these props uh, that made them look a little bit more authentic, we felt. We, we did so much work on that. Leslie Ecker was another one of our classmates at Art Center that you know, sort of uh, folded into this whole visual effects group. And he spent a month or so just developing looks and techniques for the so-called recording tape. The recording deck that would record the brainwaves of your experience and also play them back for reliving. And Doug wanted to see something on the tape that would look sexy, just would feel erotic. So for that, I got to actually go to the porn store and buy pornographic magazines, and I slit scanned this hardcore porn onto the tape and had it printed. And if you look at it carefully, you can actually see kind of what's going on. It's, it's actually really interesting because it makes for some very artistic pornography, or erotica, shall we say. And so that was one of my more unusual jobs. And people would see me doing it, and they'd say, what the heck are you doing? It's, What's with that? You know, or, do they know you're doing this? <laughs> oh yeah, Doug want, wants it. Really? It was pretty funny. My, my favorite memory of the hell sequence was Dave Stewart. I remember him standing up on a table with a handheld 65 millimeter camera on his shoulder, which is a big, heavy camera, looking down over this thing that we had built out of cow jaws and guts from a butcher and filming this stuff. And I thought, wow, this guy is really something else. And uh, I mean, I learned so much about visual effects and about miniature scale and about uh, motion control photography and visual effects photography from him. But I just, that was the moment when I felt the most amazed by him doing this work with that 65 millimeter camera on his shoulder over these reeking guts. Now, there was a butcher shop strike. The meat packers were on strike right when we started this little thing. So we couldn't get more cow jaws. My first plan was to rebuild this thing every day with new guts. But we instead had to go out and buy a bunch of dry ice and pack the stuff in ice overnight and work the same guts and jaws and crap day after day after day. And it was unbelievably stinky and gross. Uh, but um, that was, that was, it was hell. It was Dave. I wasn't the originator of the acid etch uh, model detailing approach, but we really, I thought, expanded it and took it to uh, new places on, on Blade Runner. And we used a lot of acid etch on every show after that until laser cutting sort of took over that technique. My buddy Chris Ross and I, Chris Ross, by the way, was the designer of the Energizer Bunny. He and I were tasked with building a lot of the hardware that surrounded this brain experience recording machine in, in Brainstorm. So we would do things like get the company's big giant station wagon and drive it out to Apex Surplus out here in the valley that was an aerospace surplus junkyard. And we would literally climb these mountains of junk from aerospace and military industrial complex and just look at cool looking stuff. You know, hey, look at this, toss it down into the pile. We'd leave with $2,000 worth of junk, just cramming every cubic foot of this car. Things like the framework, the chassis of a satellite that's all chemically machined and hard anodized is probably a $50,000 piece of metal. We'd get it for 100 bucks. And that proved to be actually the main chassis of the back piece on this big brainstorm recording device. And I remember we went through about 500 zip ties. This was just after zip ties were invented. So we were zip tie happy. We had a cutter and a plier and a bundle of zip ties on our belts all day long, every day. And most of that thing is held together with zip ties. And then we were also plumbing it for liquid nitrogen because it was supposed to be cryogenically cooled in the film. And so we wanted that fog falling off of it. We wanted to see that cryogenic hose all frosted up. Um, and it had to actually work. So it couldn't freeze solid and stop working. So it had to be balanced as a, as a cryogenic uh, valve system and safe because an actor was going to be in there. You can't have it dripping on your skin. It's not fun. All of those things fall under that general category of mechanical props. And that was a really fun thing for me because it was very free form. It was improvisational, but it was also about engineering. And I love crossing art and science. 
one of the interesting things to me about the people and the work that we were doing was that it's a perfect balance between art and science. If the art's not there, it's not going to work. And if the science isn't there, it's certainly not going to work. And you have to satisfy both, and they have to be intimately interrelated, and they can't be visually separated. You can't have a, a modern-day bolt in a vintage piece. You know, it has to work visually as well as mechanically. And so those action props were really interesting for that reason. On Brainstorm, uh, we started the project in this back half of this Maxella building. We transitioned straight from Blade Runner into Brainstorm. And we got a lot of the big tape machines and this giant prototype uh, brain wave recording thing that looked like a jet engine hair dryer or whatever um, in, the, in the back of Glencoe there. Uh, but then this company in the front got a huge video game contract, so they kicked us out. So we had to find a new shop, and we found a shop over in Culver City, moved everything in, and, and did a lot of the work on the uh, robot manufacturing line stuff all over there, and a lot of other props and stuff, the flight simulator. We made some huge stuff on that show. Um, we worked, by the way, with real industrial robots on the robot assembly line and learned how to use them and use that, uh, use that experience on later shows a couple of times. Um, then Natalie Wood died, and everything was shut down. And um, it was really depressing. And uh, Doug finally managed uh, to make a deal with Lloyds of London and MGM to get the show finished. And um, uh, we started up a new shop. Everything had been folded into the Maxella facility for storage. We had to, move, we had to give up the lease in Culver City. So, uh, we found this little building around the corner from Maxella. It's like 3,500 square feet. It was a frame stucco building. Set up the shop in there, finished up, brainstorm. 